people we've put on before at different places and different combinations of people. I really enjoyed doing this panel. I've been in the audio industry for, where is Ed Gray? Is he here yet? Uh, a long, long time, over 20 years. And I like to see our industry flourish and lots of new ideas percolate. So uh, it, this is exciting, of course, as a lawyer for many audio companies. It's also nice to know that you're all funded. So um, uh, my name is Heather Dembert Rafter. Uh, just really quickly, I was, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I also recently passed the UK solicitor exam. And I'm a lawyer in the US, and someday maybe we'll be doing more work here. Uh, I began as the general counsel of DigiDesign. How many of you know DigiDesign? OK, I had a chance to work with Phil Dutteridge while he'll talk about that. And now I have my own law firm called Rafter Marsh. Uh, and we represent many audio clients. I'm not going to mention them all, because I'll leave some off. And, but um, we'll talk about it if it comes up naturally. Phil, um, Philip Langeling is over there, and he works with me. And I want to thank him for swapping in. You'll notice we have a new panelist. We have uh, Tim from Endless. And uh, unfortunately, Alex Wankhammer of Sonable couldn't join us, so we did a quick switch. All right, so really quickly, with that intro, um, would like to know uh, how many of you uh, are looking to raise money? OK. Um, how many of you have already raised money and have launched companies and are just looking for ideas on how to get more? All right, how many of you are here because you just want to hear Phil Dutteridge of Focusrite speak? <laughs> OK, that, that's, that's what we figured was the natural reason. All right, anyway, we're going to cover a lot of topics. We're going to leave time for Q&A. If someone wants to shout out, because not everyone raised their hand, what topics you're thinking about hearing today, which don't involve raising money that we might touch upon, pitch decks, whatever, just shout it out right now. All right, so we'll just hopefully keep you entertained. You'll learn a lot along the way. And with that, we should switch our slide to who we all are. Uh, that's me. Uh, as I mentioned, I've now um, started a firm called Rafter Marsh. About 50% of our clients are in the audio industry. Uh, one of our clients is Rolly, and so Zen is here. Everyone here has some sort of connection so, uh, to us. I know Zen through my work representing Rolly. I very proudly know Phil Dutteridge for how many years, Phil? 24. 24 years. We worked together uh, at Digi Design when Focusrite was a key partner of Digi. We'll talk about partnerships on this panel. I know Francine, um, who, who you will see, who is a wonderful uh, person to be on the other side of a deal with. We've negotiated some deals together, including Sonable, and um, also one for uh, Brainworks Plugin Alliance. And then we now have uh, joining us Tim Exile, who is the founder of Endless. He was so kind to jump on this panel. And um, we're really thrilled to have him when Alex got sick. Uh, and I happen to actually be a friend, oh, excuse me, an angel investor. He explained to me the difference in his company. So that's kind of our inner relationships. I just want to take one quick minute to thank Juice, uh, which is owned by Roly, for putting this on. They've been a terrific supporter of our industry, and I can't thank JB and Sophie and everyone else enough for doing this. I want to do a quick shout out. There are not too many women here right now. There's a few. Steinin. OK, I want to thank, um, I'm going to do a quick display of our woman in audio. And thanks to Steinin over there, Native Instruments is a sponsor. Rafter Marsh is a sponsor. Thanks to Francine, we have Focusrite. And Accusonis is also a sponsor. So all of you meet afterwards, and we'll head over to the woman in audio event, and I'll give you details. OK, I went over my time zen. Don't be mad. You want to talk about yourself? Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Zen. Uh, I'm Zen. I'm the business controller at Roly. Uh, I've been with Roly for almost eight years now. So, kind of seen the company grow from about three people to a company that's got like four acquisitions and raised multiple uh, fundraising rounds. Um, and currently, I'm working with a company in a bunch of fundraising as well as some internal budgeting and forecasting and financial modeling. So I will next be going over some content over fundraising. Do you want to go next, or shall I? Um, well, I'm just going to say the fun, embarrassing fact we put up about people. Explain this love number and dogs more than chocolate cake. It, I think it's self-explanatory. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the reason everyone is here, Philip Dutteridge. Well, that's the reason you're here. <laughs> oh, oh, this is being taped, yes. <laughs> 
thank you, Heather. Um, I've been in the business for far too long since I was uh, 21 in 1970. And uh, my first company was started in uh, 71. Uh, and that was a two-man startup building PA systems. And uh, that was funded by uh, my retained income from working briefly for Led Zeppelin in 1970. So uh, I was looking after their PA system on a European-American tour. And they paid me well enough despite the fact that... Uh, that Wait a second. I want, we might need clarification. Have who has not heard of Led Zeppelin in this audience? Okay, <laughs> just wanted to be clear. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, their reputation was not for paying their road crew well, but uh, by the you know uh, the, the, the standards of the day, I got paid pretty damn well, about two hundred and fifty pounds a week, and that went a long way in those days. Um, my rent was ten pounds a week, so go figure. Um, so raising money to, you know, it starts with yourself uh, and, you know, then convincing people that if you're prepared to risk all yourself, then uh, maybe they would uh, come and join you, uh, in, in either working with you for free or working with you for not much money because, you know, time is money, as they say, and if people are prepared to work for free, that's an investment in itself. Um, and then banks, lending is the first place to go, um, especially if you have little to lose, and in that case, I would always say, make sure you're a limited company, because then you can borrow a bunch of money, project fails, you close the company, and the bank takes, you know, pays the bill. It's, uh, I'm just, it may sound cynical, but that's the way, the way it works. Uh, uh, being a limited company means, you, you, so long as you don't sign a personal guarantee, then you can walk away from your debts when things don't work. But fortunately, things did work in my case, and so my little PA company evolved into another one, which was uh, Soundcraft, and uh, we started that in 1973 and sold it in 1988 for a bunch of money to Harman. And with that bunch of money, I uh, invested in Focusrite, which uh, I bought from uh, Liquidator uh, after Rupert Neve got into difficulties. It was his business for five years before me. So um, with Focusrite, I invested you know, a lot of money, pretty much all the money that uh, I'd made with Soundcraft, apart from being able to pay off uh, the house. And um, from, uh, from that point, you know, uh, it, we, we spent money rather like having got a, a venture capital investment. We spent it too easily. Uh, it all went very quickly. Then we did get venture capital investment, and that went too easily. So having spent a few million pounds trying to build a business, we then had to bootstrap it, and uh, that means basically from a, you know, having very little revenue. I think we were at about £25,000 a month in revenue, and we had to make the business survive on, on the profit within that. And we did, and um, then we got lending, and uh, at one point to fund a, a new project, um, and uh, that was after we'd got out of big scary consoles and uh, oh, on the subject of big scary consoles and you can apply this to, with hardware especially large or small get your customers to help you fund it because if you've got customer interest we were selling consoles that cost hundreds of thousands uh, for big studios and uh, we would get half the money on order and then the other half on delivery That and so that first half paid for building the console, and the, the second half was our gross profit. Um, and you can do that when you're sort of making hardware in even small volumes and relatively inexpensive. If you've got enthusiastic uh, customers, I was just talking to uh, Tim about this, um, you can get them to fund maybe some or all of the cost of the product on the promise that you'll deliver it in two or three months' time, something like that. 
So funding software, that's a different thing. Well, it starts with you because you're the developer and you're in your bedroom and that's presumably paid for already. So it's uh, you, your time and your... Just quick question. How, that's a really good point, Phil. How many people are software developers? Presumably virtually everyone. Do we have any hardware developers in the room? Okay, thank you. So uh, you start with yourself and your idea and then you need more people uh, to work with you to develop the idea and at first maybe you can get them to work for free but then everyone needs to eat and pay the rent and so on. So then you need to get some working capital uh, to continue funding the development and a few hundred thousand pounds down the road you might have something you can sell. But I'll leave that to you, Tim. Uh, do you want me to add anything? How about if we weave you back into every single topic in a minute? I think we're going to talk a little bit about your strategic relationship with DigiDesign Avid, but we can do that later. And just wanted to give it a shout out to Ed Gray, who just arrived. And he's been in audio for a very long time. And we can talk about our early days doing the strategic partnership between uh, Focusrite and DigiDesign, now Avid. Okay, so uh, Phil, I think we can weave those in later. Sure. Uh, Zen, any topics that Phil hasn't yet covered that we were contemplating? Okay, so uh, next to Phil, we have Francine, and I need to tell you, I wrote the blurb about her. Calls her children trouts, and a vicious negotiator who loves shoes. So that's actually not, the vicious part was a little tongue in cheek. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how lawyers uh, work uh, on different sides of a deal to get it done, and she was on a different side of a deal we recently did. But that's, we'll save that for later. Okay, and if, do you want to introduce and yourself? And Francine is the in-house counsel at Focus Rides in High Wycombe, and she looks after us and makes sure we don't get into trouble. How's she doing, Phil? She's doing great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank, thank you, everyone. Hello. So I joined Focusrite just over a year ago um, with having no background in music or software or hardware, so I'm still very much learning. So if anyone does come and talk to me after, be aware you'll need to use words of one syllable, possibly pitches as well. Thank you. Okay. Yes, it is you, um, Tim. And again, thank you yesterday for responding eagerly to an email that Philip sent asking you to join our panel. I, I'm, a te I'm an attention seeker, it's fine. You're, uh, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, I'm Tim Exile. Um, I had a previous life as a musician, which still kind of like tapers on today, but um, I now I'm the founder of Endless. Um, we <coughs> really, we want to do to music making what TikTok did to video, what Instagram did to photography, what Twitter did to the written word, which is, you know, to turn it into something that we use as a language to communicate that it's short, it's brief, it's social, it's fun, it's gamified. Um, so we've been, me and the team, have been working on this for about three years. Um, we launched our beta, 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 whatever, um, in uh, kind of April this year. Uh, it's gone really, really well. Um, you know, we're still we're still solving some uh, technology. There's a lot of technology that's involved in kind of real time collaboration for music. Um, but the, uh, you know, our, our average daily users spend more time using Endless than the average daily Facebook user or Twitter user or Instagram or Snapchat user. So it's all looking very, very exciting. We're, work, we're working towards a launch early next year. Um, and yeah, so the funding history of Endless, I um, put, yeah, basically all my money into it. You know, like it's probably not quite as much money, but it was still all my money. <laughs> Um, you know, that money came from the products that I've done with uh, my friends at Native Instruments. We, um, and uh, so, yeah, and, and Matt, who was at Native at the time, is now at Ableton. Um, I, you know, basically, I part, it was and a partnership. who else has invested in Endless, Philip? Well, yeah, uh, well, yes, well, no, no, no but the, so the, these, <laughs> so that's the, that's the first, but this is the, um, uh, you know, how, how I got the money that I put into Endless first was through these products. Um, put all my money into that. Then um, we had some government, uh, we did um, Innovate UK uh, grant, um, that really helped us. Then we did a friends and family round, and then an angel round. Um, we have some of our uh, lovely angel investors in the room. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, we're just at the point, uh, we'll be raising more funds uh, next year. Um, 
looking for more, maybe more kind of strategic investors and, you know, sort of more angel investment. Trying to hold back from um, venture capital as long as we can, um, because, you know, you, I think with venture capital, I'm, uh, I'm getting into a pining here, but you shall are. I? Yeah. Okay, so now we all wonder why no VC money, but we are going to demystify all these terms. Even I get confused. I thought I was a friends and family investor in Endless. He's like, no, you're an angel. So, okay, so we're going to learn. Zen is going to explain the topics. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, I'm a lawyer who loves live music and uh, yoga, so I'm going to ask you all to take a quick inhale, exhale, because we're about to get into the very heavy stuff with Zen. And there's going to be a quiz after, okay? All right. Yes. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, Heather. Um, so I'm going to run through some basic stuff to do with um, fundraising, essentially. Uh, so we're going to be going over certain sources of funding, uh, when they're kind of relevant, and then looking at some of the characteristics that are there. And guys, please feel free to pitch in, like if you've got stories, something interesting, just, just pitch into it. Um, so here's like a little uh, summary of some of the sources of funding that we have. Uh, so when you're, when you're like, when you have like a project or a code or uh, a company and you're just starting up, uh, you're initially going to want to look at funding that um, basically is, well, for you guys especially, it's going to be within the tech industry. So government grants and subsidies and particular incubators and accelerators are pretty useful with that. Uh, like Tim mentioned, he's actually been with Innovate UK, which does a lot of tech investment in the, in the, um, in the UK. Uh, there's a bunch of similar projects within the US as well. So uh, I'm going to go through certain examples uh, in the following slide. So government grants and subsidies, you're not really looking at a lot of um, involvement by them, not much equity. They, they kind of want you to return money into the economy. Whereas incubators and accelerators are lo looking for something. They're looking for equity in the company or uh, some sort of return on a loan. Yes? Just <coughs> if this is a good time to break. Yeah. What was your experience, both of you, with Innovate UK? Um, my experience was actually pretty good. We did about five different projects with them, which ranged from uh, proof of concept to proof of market to uh, prototyping, um, and then also looking at uh, over different products. So uh, they had monitoring officers come in, which who were actually really sweet as well, um, surprisingly. Um, but no, the process was pretty simple. You pitch your ideas. If you're delayed, they kind of give you extensions. So it was. So it you was fill out an application useful. just to really quickly and chime in too. You fill out an application. Is it that? Is it pretty easy to get money? What are they looking for? Uh, they're specifically looking. F they've got a certain criteria that they don't really uh, disclose to you, and they might give you certain marks over different sections of the application. And uh, it's, it's hard to really tell exactly what they're looking for, but I think it depends on the round you're applying uh, during and the relative kind of attraction towards your company versus someone else who's applied in the same round. So it really depends on that. Anything to add? Uh, yeah, we worked, with a, um, we worked with a grant writer um, who'd done like 15 applications already. Um, and so I, I think that was, um, that was the difference between us getting it and not, because also we were very, I mean, we were super green. Right. Super noob at that point, um, so we didn't really know what the difference between like proof of market, proof of concept, prototyping was. We just kind of would have blitzed this application. So I mean, I, I would, I think if you're new to this, I'd definitely see if you can find um, find a grant writer. I could even, you know, I could put you in touch with this the guy who did it for us. Very useful. How many people here are thinking about trying to get a government grant or have done so? And is this in the UK? Keep your arms up if UK. How many in the US? Okay, all right, so we, we've got resources on that to talk about separately. Um, I have no idea, so please enlighten us, how much money can you get via the government grant writing process? Um, I think within the Innovate UK, this, it depends on which scheme you apply for. It could be up to, I believe it's 300,000 uh, pounds, which needs a bit of a match funding, but it <laughs> really depends on the type of uh, industry you're from and what kind of project you're applying for. Okay, so it sounds like thumbs up. This is a good way to get money. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone have a bad experience in the audience with this? Okay. <laughs> Phil. Uh, the, the good thing about grants is you generally don't have to pay them back. Yeah. It's it's and, it's, it's okay, free money. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, so then going into incubators and accelerators, like I mentioned, uh, when I first joined Roly, we were already part of an incubator called Design London. 
And uh, their particular scheme was actually, uh, they give you a loan and they want like a return on, on the loan either at the end of the term or they want to have equity in the company. Now that's completely up to you, which way you want to take it. Uh, you could raise some funds and kind of repay that, or uh, you could give them equity. Uh, so it depends. Uh, usually that's over a short period, a period of time as well. Did you um, do that to him as well? No. <clears throat> okay, thumbs up on that. Did that go all right? Uh, it was good, because you get a space that you're working in. Uh, you get to network with other companies as well. Um, and uh, they also had s uh, professionals who were advisors. So they could help you specifically either in the tech industry or with finance or with like getting you in touch with someone in, in, um, in marketing. Um, so that, that was pretty useful in terms of the accelerator. And there's uh, similar corollaries in the US that we have resources yeah. on. How many here are doing the incubator model? Okay, one. Uh, going all right? Yeah. And who are you incubating with? The Rattle US. Oh. The Rattle US? They're only, only recently opened, right? Cool. Terrific. Okay. Well, touch base with us afterwards and we'll add your information to our slides that we're going to hand out. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, the next one is crowdfunding. That's what Phil was just talking about, where you kind of look at your customers or potential customers and uh, you ask them to kind of pay you or prepay you for whatever you're developing and uh, that money then helps you build whatever you're developing essentially. Um, a lot of, I mean, this is this has been out there for quite some time. But Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you've got lots of lots of online companies kind of helping you Go build that me. up. GoFundMe as well. Uh, um, how many have done uh, a crowdfunding campaign in the audience? Okay, how many are thinking yeah, about it? Because we, with Roly, recently <coughs> did one. Uh, you going to mention quickly the Lumi? Uh, yeah, uh, we actually did a crowdfunding campaign with the Lumi, uh, which is one of our new learning uh, hardware uh, keyboards that we're launching any time now, actually. Um, it was a pretty big success, and we had a lot of reception. A lot of people have basically been uh, asking when they can actually pre-order some more or, or buy more. So it's been good. Yeah. And uh, the legal requirements? I don't know, Francine, have you ever worked on one of those crowdsourcing? So I'll just speak really briefly. It's really clear what the rules are. You've got to be transparent. You know this. Uh, you've got to keep communicating if for some chance there's a delay. Uh, all the rules are there and uh, you have to follow them. So, but they weren't too onerous. No. Just transparency, honesty, candor, all those usual rules. Yep. Okay. Uh, the next one is personal investment, which is basically your wallet, your bank account, whatever you can put in. What it really does is, what, what a personal investment really does is it gives faith to your future investors that if you're willing to put your money into the into the business, then they kind of have more confidence in your product. Um, and both Tim and Phil, I believe, have done that in the past. So you've got examples right here. Um, so Yeah, Tim, um, you want to talk a little bit? about, uh, did you beg, borrow, and steal? You mentioned a little bit where you got it from, but you put in your own money? Yeah, I mean, so that, that was um, basically for making my own products. You know, I, I, work, I program in Reactor. Woo! <coughs> um, sorry, shout out to Native Instruments. So, uh, um, so yeah, I, I, I just, probably like most people here, I mean, you probably just love developing um, tools and, uh, and, you know, the stuff that you missed in your musical lives. Um, and you know, I just followed that, learned how to turn these things into products, and eventually, you know, some of those products made, you know, enough money for me to put in and bootstrap a business. But I think that's probably one of the most viable ways to get money for for most people here. I would have a guess. You know, I'm stereotyping, but yeah. so how much legality did you do when you put in your own money? I don't know. If Francine wants to help talk you through this, but you probably consulted with lawyers and made sure that you had some protection if the company then didn't work out, right? Um, well, um, I mean, half of it is, uh, well, half of it went kind of um, before we even incorporated. So it was, just, you know, it was very much just like, you know, I, I came into this as an artist. You've got to remember, I started out as an artist rather than a, a, and a businessman. You know, artists are very much passionate. I was just like, I don't care what happens to this money. I want to make this thing happen. And then I got, you know, 
a fair chunk of the, the, the money and I was just like, well, hang on, I need to be sensible about this. So the other half was basically structured as a, an intercompany loan between um, my company, sort of Tim XR Limited and Endless Limited, which is, you know, payable back. As we um, say, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, so you, <laughs> yeah. right, at some point, if you're going to start putting in your own money, consult with lawyers, have a good accountant, right, Zen, and, yeah. and make sure that you figure out a way that it's obvious that's your money and you don't commingle and you also have a corporate structure that, in, that protects you should something go wrong with your product. Anything else, Francine, or Phil, on that? Yeah, well, I'd like to just say uh, on that note that um, tax, uh, if, you're, if you're spending money and not earning it, then you're building up tax losses. Now, tax losses can be applied when you actually start making a profit. So, uh, if, uh, obviously, everybody is starting out hoping one day to make a profit from their investment of time and money in their project. Um, so it's really important to structure early on, right from the start. Um, I mentioned limited companies before. And then um, if you're going to have uh, private, your own money going in, that's a loan. You, that gets repaid tax-free. You don't have to, uh, to, to pay tax on that when you take it out. Um, if you're borrowing money from one company to another, if you've got a window cleaning company here and a software company there, um, then... Uh, that's how I really make my money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, use professional advisors uh, from the get-go, whether it's lawyers or accountants, they're really important. Uh, they'll, so, they'll save you a fortune if, uh, if they're good advisors. And uh, as a member of the legal profession, you can find good lawyers who are going to offer startup package deals too, and being willing to have lesser rates and kind of uh, work with you and to, in, in the hopes that you'll grow bigger. So uh, there are a lot of options out there. Don't be intimidated. This is not a, a time to cut corners with financial advisors, tax loss, carry forwards, all this good stuff. Uh, as the token suit on this panel, um, <laughs> I, want, I, I just want to say to everybody who's, who's doing this, who's actually investing in, in a project, uh, a it is a business. As soon as you start investing your own money or somebody else's, you're, you're in business. One day you'll be wearing a suit, metaphorically or otherwise. Um, and chairman but, of a public company, right? So, so, so you know, it's something that my son, who's a musician, uh, has you know, still to get over the fact that if he wants to make a living in music, he's in business. It's not just art, it's business. Uh, so all of you have got to get over any kind of cultural um, anxiety about business. It's a business. Uh, and uh, and uh, I hope I'm not being patronizing in saying that. A passion and a business, right? Can yeah, be both. absolutely. I mean, it, it all starts with passion. Francine, did we leave anything out? You're the serious lawyer on the panel. <laughs> no, you didn't actually. What um, Tim described is a very straightforward way of how most people do start up in businesses. Okay. All right, Zed, I know we're cutting into your time. Well, Please that's cool. continue. That's good. It's a good discussion. Um, anything finance, uh, wearing your finance cap that you wanted to add to this thing about starting a company, the topic, and investing your own money? That's great. All, that's all we're going through right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, after the personal investment, the, the next four is where it kind of gets a little more serious. You need more, well, legal advice, I suppose. So you've got angel and seed investments. So you've got some, this basically involves high net worth individuals or people willing to invest in your, in your idea, your projects, your company, um, early on in the project, usually. Um, and then uh, if you're looking for something bigger, then you move over to VCs, which are basically funds that are worth quite a lot and they're managed by professionals who have a pretty keen interest within the tech, tech world or specifically within software. Um, when it comes down to venture capital and venture debt and private equity, they're more global in the sense that uh, you could have investors in other, country, com in other countries kind of investing in the UK. Um, with venture debt, which is the next one, that, uh, that kind of uh, is distinguished between, uh, sorry, sorry to distinguish between venture debt and bank loans, uh, venture debt kind of is something that's more um, startup-y. So you've got, um, 
you've basically got these companies who kind of understand that you're going to be raising funds, you're going to be growing, and you're going to be making losses in the beginning. Whereas if you go to a bank, they're going to want to see your credit ratings, they're going to, they're going to want to see profits, they're going to want to see you, want, see you be able to repay those loans almost instantly. Uh, so that's where venture debt kind of comes in, which kind of gives you a bit more of a period, different interest rates, but at the same time they're more helpful in terms of their resources. And uh, private equity, which is the final one on this slide here, that is for more established companies. So when you're actually a mature company or you've got a mature product, that's when they want to kind of come in and be like, okay, we're gonna take over. And they've got more control in that sense as well. Uh, anything you wanna add? Uh, there's something I think it's called these days the Enterprise Guarantee Scheme. It's a government guarantee uh, to lending banks. So uh, if you don't have collateral, uh, you can go to a business bank, like you know, the big four, or uh, and, and even Metro Bank, I think, uh, support this too. Uh, and um, no doubt other banks uh, are, are also supporting it. Um, but they need to be business focused branches rather than you know the regular high street if that even exists um, so um, uh, this scheme uh, which I've used in the past uh, a long time ago but it, it, it was then called um, the uh, something else loan guarantee scheme it's the same concept just different branding attached to it um, the the bank acts as the agent for the government in, in determining whether your project is worthy of supporting. So they look at the you know, the the business potential of the uh, of the idea. And um, for a startup, you can ra you can raise a modest amount. And for an established business that has revenue, you can. Uh, I think borrow up to something like half a million under this scheme, and it covers the bank for something like 85%. So the one thing you can't have if you've got haven't already pledged your house, uh, they want you to. Um, uh, and there's a, an exclusion there, which is if your wife says no, um, if you 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 can't put your house on the line. That's the thing to do. Don't put your house on the line. But, uh, but they want to see that you've got no independent capital, or sorry, capital asset that you can secure the debt with. But it, it's a really, it does work. It's a really good scheme. They don't advertise it. True. Um, there's a few links here, a few examples of the different sources of fundings. I'm not going to go through these because I think we mentioned these as and we went along. And we'll share these with you afterwards. Yeah. If you give us your information, we'll. Um, send out the slide deck with all this information because we do want to leave time for some Q&A as well. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to go Are over this. Are you going to mention EIS? Um, I could. Enterprise but Investment uh, Scheme, uh, SCIS and EIS, the S is for smaller amounts of money. Yep. Uh, it's for um, angel investors um, especially, um, basically private uh, investors in businesses um, can get tax uh, allowances on their investment going in and tax-free capital gains uh, on exit. Uh, that is when the uh, investment uh, matures, shall we say, yep. and you're able to uh, uh, buy back the shares or sell the shares on uh, to another party. Uh, the capital gain is tax-free. And there's also a, a, a tax relief if the uh, business fails uh, after three years, uh, you can get tax relief on your loss. So you've got tax relief going in, tax relief when it fails, or capital gains tax-free if it succeeds. It's pretty good. And uh, SEIS is the most generous of those. I can't remember what the limit is on that. but uh, Have you done that, either one of those? First two years after incorporation, um, and 150,000, uh, up to 150,000, you can issue in SEIS shares. That's great for the friends and family. Yeah. That's great for angel investors. Yeah. 
And it's actually, but it's private money, it's not corporate money, so it's anyone who pays income tax benefits from yep. uh, that type of uh, I think, I think scheme. One of the criteria on that is that the company's assets need to be less than 15 million pounds. So if you're raising up until that, that's great. If it's more than that, then it's a so bit of a... We will add issue. that to our slides. We yeah. don't have there. We will definitely yeah, we do that. So we're running... We have a lot to cover. You all are continuing to do your deep breathing, and we're getting through this. We're almost done. Then you're going to show where these apply at each stage? Yes. So the different stages of product growth and how they kind of correlate to the different sources of funding. Um, so your your product or your project could be in the concept stage where it's just an idea, or it could be in a proof of concept stage where it's it's been somewhat validated and you've kind of proven that it kind of works. Uh, prototyping kind of is intertwined with proof of concept when it comes to software but um, it's more, you've kind of tested it a lot more. Uh, then launch and growth and maturity is more to do with how, how well it sells and how well it kind of goes into the market. So the first four of the, of the source of funding that we mentioned, the government grants, tech incubators, crowdfunding, and personal investment as well, are kind of valid until the prototyping stage. Uh, the government especially wants to fund a lot of R&D within the UK, the EU, and the US. So that's very attractive for them. Um, and that's the stage up until which they want to invest. Uh, and then VC, angel investment and VCs uh, kind of come more in the early stage, which is the prototyping and launch phase. But when you're kind of growing or you're expanding, that's when you've got venture debt, bank loans, private equity kind of coming through and trying to build, build on that. Um, I'll actually write down some notes on these as well once I share the slides, but uh, I think we need to go into a different section. We do, uh, and notice the very apex yeah. is the IPO, which is Focusrite. I think Focusrite, are there any other public companies in the audio space besides mega, mega companies that also do more than audio? Are you the only public company? Oh, you're looking at me. Uh, I'm trying to think. Anyone know any others? Uh, the only other, Audio only, yeah, focus, no. No, there isn't. Okay. I mean, the closest would be Gear for Music, which is a retailer. Okay. Um, I hope you all have questions about how to go public. That means you have uh, learned your lessons well from fundraising. One last question for Tim, because um, did you have a consultant to help you think about all these different ways to raise money? Um, I didn't. I didn't find a consultant to do this, but um, you know we we have a few advisors um, who are really good. Um, I was, I don't know, you know, I met people, spoke to people, um, yeah, picked up bits of advice along the way. But now we have some some sort of official advisors who help us as well. Okay, uh, hopefully JB will let us go over five minutes. I see he just walked in, and so hopefully, just really quickly, when you mentioned the EIS and the new other stuff, not yet on our chart. Where would they fall on there? Uh, they would be in the initial stages. Uh, so angel and seed investment, they're kind of part of that uh, round of funding. Okay, we are quickly... Incidentally, there are sort of fund managers that run EIS um, funds. They're not strictly funds because each investment has to be direct from the individual, but they, they, they act as a wholesaler, if you like. Um, and, uh, and and so yeah, for you know quality investment yeah. propositions, it means that uh, you know you might be raising a big chunk of money, but you can be raising it from maybe a hundred or five hundred people through one of those funds. Uh, okay. We're going to give you a preview of the slides we are not covering because Francine has wonderful information she's going to share in a minute. We haven't heard much from her. Do you want to quickly flip through what we're going to be sending out? Um, yeah, uh, the characteristics of funding sources. So you've got things ranging from easy access to bureaucratic obstacles to offering supporting experience. Uh, I'll write down some notes before I share these slides as well, just so I can go over the content. But uh, this should be pretty useful to all of you, hopefully. Um, and then uh, we've also got some stuff to what to include in a business plan and in a financial plan which are basically a lot of buzzwords and things you should look out for when you're pitching. And when we send out this information, we'll give you a, um, a URL to a source of wonderful ways to write a business plan, some examples. I'm not sure if Tim is going to uh, maybe redact some information, but share some a business plan you put together. But we'll get you uh, any information you need to make this easy for you. <laughs> I didn't hear a yes. Did you? OK, well. I'd, I'd have to look back. Okay, um, we'll find I you. Put together a, a deck or sort of, uh, we can do a redacted yeah. one. Would that be useful? How many people would like to see some examples of actual business plans? 
we, we are here to serve, because JB is in the audience. OK, we will get this done. Um, all right, Whew. OK, uh, up next. Francine, we only have about 10 minutes to cover every interesting topic, which would be M&A and IPO. Uh, that seems probably not as relevant. How many of you are thinking about already trying to sell your company or go public? OK, we're going to quickly skip over that, but happy to answer questions later about that. I was lucky to be at DigiDesign when we were acquiring M-Audio, Sibelius, uh, Virtual Instrument Group, so happy to talk M&A. Uh, negotiation and due diligence. You go, Francine. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, as you all heard from Heather, I'm a lawyer. And I guess your question to me is, what do I need a lawyer for? Um, well, basically, the agreements that you will enter into as part of your fundraising or your design will be very long and complicated, and your lawyer will guide you through all those pages of legal speak and make it really simple for you to understand. So that's what lawyers do for you when you're starting out a business and raising money. And I think the next question is, well, when would you involve a lawyer? I guess Heather would say right from the beginning and all the way through. I guess I, as an industry lawyer, would say, give your lawyer an early heads up as to what's going on. Tell them the idea that you've got coming forward so that they know what's um, going and to happen. Most of us will, if you really don't have any money and you're just starting out and you just want to bounce ideas, especially those of us passionate about audio, we're happy to listen and help you and just tell you, hey, here's a budget. Um, let's think about what you need to do first and how to phase it in and make it work. Right, Francine? Yeah. We're, we're not terrible people, I hope. OK. <laughs> What do you think? Well, I am. I know the nice ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Avoid um, the ones that says. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then get your lawyer more involved and on your side ready to fight your corner when you've got sort of the basics of an agreement. So this is what you're doing, when you're going to be doing it, and how much you're doing it for. And then when you've got your lawyer, I guess you're going to ask them, well, what are you going to do for me apart from charge me lots of money? Your lawyer acts in your best interest, so they've got their boxing gloves and they're standing in the corner in the ring fighting for you. They'll help you get ready, which is a really important thing that'll come on to you, and they'll negotiate the agreements that you can just get on with doing what it is you guys do best. <laughs> and we would, and also work closely with a tax consultant and a financial advisor, right, Zen? Like, they both are necessary, as Phil said, professionals, find those professionals, yeah. Okay. Yeah, recommendation, uh, because there's, you know, thousands of lawyers in the in the country, and and only some of them are qualified really to do this sort of work through their specialisation and experience. Um, how do you find them? Well, you can go to large firms, uh, uh, and uh, if they've got a thousand lawyers, they might have one or two that know what they're doing in this area. Um, but um, best to get recommendations from other people who've been through processes and have had successful experience. And if you have an angel investor or a um, high net worth individual is putting a lot of money in, they might dictate to you uh, a law firm they want you to use, right? That happens sometimes, at least for the corporate documenting, the financials and the corporate transaction and the equity, equity especially. So listen, right? And that's it. Okay. So one of the things that's important to me when I'm in my capacity acting for the company, looking at um, a project we're going to either invest in or work together with someone in, it's, it's um, getting, that, getting the partner with us ready. Um, and your lawyer will know what I mean when I say, what I'm doing is I'm checking the identity of the person before me. Are they the right person? Do they have the knowledge? Do they have the authority to bind the company? Secondly, and this is probably the most important point, I'm going to be checking your intellectual property. I want to know that what is going to be created for us will belong to us, if that's what we agree, or it belongs to you, so that there's no one chasing me down the road saying that the product, the product you've just launched is an exact copy of my idea or my rights. So just super quickly on this point, uh, in terms of owning your IP, this is where you need to really think early about consulting with someone. Make sure any developer who works with you that you get an assignment of IP rights. Make sure uh, any licensing in of technology is really clear and hopefully uh, will be able to be uh, transferable, assignable, but just make sure that everything, anything else to add on that is clean ownership or clean licenses of IP. Yeah. Um, and when you're ready to come to this negotiation, what I'd say to you is know what your lines are. So work with your lawyer to work out 
what it is you can deliver, because no one's going to be happy if you can't stick to the timetable that has been agreed, or if you come back to the company saying, oh, we need more money, otherwise we're going to go under, and then it'll all go to pot. And don't over-promise, so don't say you can do something if you just don't have the skills or expertise to do that. Um, and also understand what the, the person who's contracting with you, what the other side thinks is important to them in terms of the project, because that will really help you smooth the negotiations out a lot more. Do you want to add anything? I, any, um, we'll leave time for questions. So really quickly, since we don't have Alex here, we were going to also move next on to uh, strategic partnerships, negotiations, and due diligence. Do we just want to give quick tips on that? Anyone want to say their favorite points on those topics? So I guess what I spend the majority of my time negotiating is um, what is it we're getting and who's going to own it? And then what happens if it doesn't work out? You all might be surprised to hear that price isn't in that list. It's important, but not really to me as a lawyer, um, other than being clear that I, as the buyer, am not being fleeced and that the people who are providing the services aren't sort of being paid slave labor wages. Should I speak? So yeah, I think we should just quickly, would folks like to also hear a little bit about strategic partnerships with larger companies and how that is a really wonderful way to make money while you're growing your companies? A show of hands on that, is that? I, I would think that was valuable. So, um, okay, do you wanna, we are supposed to be done in three minutes, but JB, can we go five minutes over for Q&A? The, the keynote is Okay. Okay, so, so he's playing that. Did anyone quickly have a question for Tim before we lose him? And besides saying thank you for adding this into his schedule. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I'll be hanging around if you want to ask me anything. Okay, so you can ask questions afterwards. Okay. Strategic partnerships. With so, really quickly. Um, about 25 years ago, uh, when Focusrite was really small, uh, and we had an analog reputation, I was approached at a trade show, AES, in San Francisco by Dave Froker, who was uh, the number two at uh, Digital Design at the time. He was in charge of the third party developer program. And um, he asked me uh, if we would like to become a developer. And I said, yes, and I, uh, not knowing what it meant. Um, and then uh, developing what? And he said, well, plugins for Pro Tools. So I had to ask him what a plugin was. And when he'd explained that, I said, well, we don't know how to do that, but you do. So why don't you do the Focusrite plugins? You know, why don't you do the, the stuff that we don't know how to do? And what they did was to uh, uh, code basically the plugins that emulated the Focusrite EQ and compressor. And um, it was a very successful relationship uh, for many, many years for both parties. And uh, Dave always credited that uh, uh, with helping to put Pro Tools on the map as a professional application, uh, which was very kind of him to say so. Um, now. We got royalties for that. Now, uh, number one, we couldn't have done plugins. You guys can, you know, that's what you do. So uh, um, it, you have to think laterally in all business situations and, and where you uh, are being asked or you see an opportunity for something that you can't do. Try. In our case, we flipped it on its head. Um, and subsequently, we developed hardware for, uh, for DigiDesign. Uh, because they were too busy doing the big stuff. So we did the little stuff. We, and we designed the first M-Box. Uh, and it was sold by uh, Digital Design under a dual branding agreement, uh, which you wrote. And uh, um, uh, we got royalties, and uh, it was very successful. And that helped us build our balance sheet so that when we wanted to start investing in uh, our own... Uh, uh, our own audio interfaces, we had money in the bank to do it. Um, and to be honest with you, that's how Focusrite has become the company it is today, by having a great partnership with Digital Design back then and, and subsequently. And these days we partner still with um, uh, promoting uh, Pro Tools with our audio interfaces uh, for... Uh, people who are coming to audio recording for the first time. 
Okay, so our time is coming to an end. I, is the suggestion that we take Q&A? Do you want to email us with questions? Is there someone who has a question they're dying to ask? I can tell you there are representatives here from Native Instruments. Uh, I do work for Ableton. There's probably someone here from Ableton. Uh, Philip and I are also lawyers for BrainWorks Plugin Alliance. You've got focus, right? If you want to talk about strategic partnerships, this is the place to do. I forgot an important thing. Okay, and then uh, we're here to help you establish those partnerships. Okay. And yeah, the the, uh, the final part of that is now it, it works the other way around. Now we're the big company, and we have a number of uh, partners, software developers, and so on. Uh, we have the plugin collective that you may have read about that you can find out about on the focus right uh, website you can talk to us too we're very approachable we have uh, people who are waiting for your call now okay so the bottom line is we are all here to help we all love this industry we're here to support it I thank our panelists so much for joining us today and uh, Roly also, feel free to talk with them about partnerships. We are all here, thank you so much. And to end on my, another yoga phrase, namaste and go have fun and uh, check out what's next. Imogene Heap, thank you JB again for putting this together and thank you Roly and Juice.